On Monday, June 26, 2017, East Tennessee PBS, in partnership with the Tennessee Picnic, hosted a conversation with members of Cock and Jefferson County's black community. They shared their reflections of the 8th of August emancipation celebrations, locally called the Tennessee Picnic. Moderated by Mr. Roland Dykes III, each participant shared personal insights from the era of Jim Crow, as well as family recollections, hopes for future generations, and their feelings on the current struggles for equality. These are their voices. Hello, my name is Roland Dykes III. I am current president of the Tennessee Picnic. I'd like to welcome you all to East Tennessee Voices panel discussion regarding the Tennessee Picnic in Newport, Tennessee. We are currently at New Zion AME Zion Church in Newport, Tennessee, and I have with me five members of the community who are gonna discuss what their remembrances of the Tennessee Picnic. I'm Vivian Ray Dockery. Alzara Carr Rader. Patricia Dixon Badgett. My name is Anthony Rice, Sr. Carlene Robinson. What we're gonna do, we have several questions that we're gonna to pose to our members, our community members, about their remembrances of the Tennessee picnic uh, going back at least 70 years, and some say at least se a minimum of 75. First question I'll ask is, what one word comes to mind when you think about the Tennessee picnic? I think about the barbecue mutton that my great-grandfather used to make all the time. Every time the 8th of August came around, he would be barbecuing that mutton. And mm -hmm. also uh, the good food that my cousin Nettie Sue would prepare, because she could make some delicious cakes. And I always wanted a piece of her cake. She would give me a very thin piece, something that you could read the 23rd Psalms through. And I said, I want a bigger piece. She said, but I have to... I have to save some for Della and some of the people that are coming in town. So these are the things that I think about when I think about the 8th of August. Although I'm from Detroit, I'm the first one born in Detroit, but my people are Newport, Tennessee. So I think of family, and in particular, the barbecue goat. My first experience with barbecue goat. <laughs> I think of family and I think that it's a very festive time probably the only time during the whole year um, that a lot of parties, a lot of families, I think of festivities. And I think of family also, but I also think about some of the, all the dances we used to have at the Memorial Building and helping my dad when, and uh, my brother uh, carrying ice to the bar when we had to set up our own bar at the time. And, uh, I was probably a very young guy at the time, probably eight or nine years old, but I always helped dad at the bar. I remember that very fondly. What are your memories then of the week of the Tennessee picnic and how did that, how did it evolve throughout the week for you? Tennessee picnic was a time when uh, many adults left their domestic jobs and the low paying jobs here in Newport and they went north to Chicago, Detroit, New York, and Ohio to get better jobs. And when they came back to Newport for vacation type, you know, a vacation type trip, it was in around the 8th of August. And that's why it was called the Tennessee Picnic because most of the people that would come back that left Newport were from Tennessee. And when they came back, you know, we would start cooking the food and everything because I had two aunts that lived in New York and they would come back. And my, our family loved chicken and dumplings. So, so anyway, my grandmother and great-grandmother, they would cook chicken and dumplings and banana pudding. So those are the foods that I can remember that we fed just the family at our house, you know, when they first came back. And then after that, well, we started preparing food for the 8th of August to take to the park. During my uh -huh. time, I remember uh, we, we always had a dance. Everybody looked forward to the big dance at the end of the week, which was always on Friday. And then we always had a pageant, a Tennessee picnic pageant. The thing that stood out to me in the pageant was the talent show. 
And I remember, you know, the different people was on the talent sh show, and we have had a lot of talent that came out of that Tennessee picnic. Some have went on and, you know, done great things. We had a welcome party started, which started, usually started the week. That was a party to welcome all our visitors back and we always had a, a combo band. Those are the things that I remember. The picnic would be on Saturday. Uh, typically there would be a block party on a different day, but each day was set up for different activities. Right. You know, and not everybody could come and stay the whole week. So you would see the agenda and work out your schedule best you can and stay as long as you could, you know. Trying to define the Tennessee picnic for me is, is really kind of difficult, but I, I see it as nothing more or less than a community affair, uh, a community celebration, a uh, community celebration of emancipation, of uh, family coming back and being involved in the community again. Uh, celebration. Just, yes, a celebration of life and uh, how far we've come. If you would then briefly share one story that immediately comes to mind when you think of the Tennessee picnic. If I'm not mistaken, on Sunday, the churches got together and had their uh, worship service. And that was very interesting because usually the preachers that day were those who was originally from here, but was moving, living out of town. And they came back and I remember that they would do the preaching for us on the Sunday morning. I guess I think about uh, the fact that we, you know, most of the children had a big time at the swimming pool. Now I didn't swim because I was kind of afraid of water, but my sister and brother, they were all happy about the fact that they could go swimming on that one day, you know, that was actually allowed for African Americans to go swimming. That wasn't the only day because we would go like on Mondays to the swimming pool, but that 8th of August, everybody looked forward to it. I think of the dance or the dances that they held. I think of the festivities at the um, city park. And uh, in particular, I was kind of excited knowing we were coming uh, from Detroit. And typically we would come three or four carloads like a caravan. It was exciting. I was anxious. It reminded me of going to Disney World, but at the time, it wasn't no Disney, you know what I mean? Uh, but it was great. And the fact when we got here, we would see relatives and friends, and I learned just about everybody is sort of related in one way or another. I remember getting new outfits to wear to the dance. The, the dance at the Memorial Building were the best, even uh, in comparison to the ones that we have today. So. Um, and, and a few times we did have some big name uh, people, uh, artists that come in and perform at those dances, but we always had a live band, uh, which made it kind of special. My <clears throat> best remembrance at the time is that it was of that one week when, we, when I was younger, in particular, when we actually got to go to the park to the swimming pool. We were allowed that one week, all week, and then Later on, a few years later, we were able to go uh, on Mondays, one day a week. And then, of course, after segregation ended, it, it became open to everyone. But uh, I remember that very fondly. And I do remember, like Carlene said, getting to buy that one outfit to go to the dance with and uh, seeing on TVs how some folks in the cities, like Anthony in Detroit, how folks dress there and trying to emulate that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that was, that was a really fun time. African Americans are only allowed to go to Newport City Pool, as I said, uh, for that one week during the, the before 1963. And after, after that, uh, 1964 or so, it became one day a week. But on the 8th of August, did you recognize at that time how unfair that was? I probably realized it all along, that it was unfair. But that was just the way of life, you know, that was just it. But I'm sure I realized that all along, you know, because we had, I lived over in Paritsville. Mm -hmm. 
and our closest friends were the Caucasians. And they could go, so we couldn't understand why we couldn't go. Coming from out of town, I thought it was a little bit strange that the park was open uh, for black folks only once a week. It didn't mean a lot at the time, and it took me till I became an adult sort of to understand why we came here as a caravan. Um, racism was the furthest thing from my mind. In time, we talked and we always brought um, a packaged lunch. I thought it was great, but uh, they sort of kept it from me. Uh, we weren't able to stop anywhere except to get gas. So we had to pack a lunch. As a kid, I didn't understand. If you had to relieve yourself, you pulled on the side of the road. Uh, and I can even remember a time or two we got stopped um, by the police in different states. And uh, my grandfather always had money to pay some trumped up ticket. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I was happy to get here. And once I was here, everything was fine. Um, and I was a kid, you know. They made sure I had a fun time. Yeah. Well, in reference to the pool, uh, I, I attribute the fact that we were not allowed to go swimming, the fact that I can't swim today, uh, <laughs> because we didn't have that opportunity to learn. But I don't remember a lot of um, racial um, controversy. Uh, I'm sure it was there, but uh, being a kid, we probably didn't, didn't recognize it as much as the adults would have. But uh, I did know that it was unfair uh, for us to only be limited, uh, have limited access to the city pool, especially since we're citizens of this community and uh, our parents did pay taxes. I think we were so happy to have access to the pool that one week, mm -hmm. what happened before then didn't matter. Right. I, I agree with you, Anthony. As, as a matter of fact, just having it that one week didn't negate the fact how, how much we looked forward to having it. We Absolutely. knew that that one week was coming and it was just before school started again. We looked really, really looked forward to doing that. Those weren't the only things that were uh, steeped in, in racism, I guess, and segregation at the time. At the time, I can also remember uh, the colored and white water fountains at, at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. I can remember the, um, uh, old enough to remember having to go to, when you went to the drugstore, if you wanted a sandwich or if you wanted a prescription field, you had to step around to the back side where they would allow you to uh, receive your, your food or your prescription or whatever, mm -hmm. but you couldn't go inside, you couldn't sit at the counter, mm -hmm. uh, and you couldn't wait inside. So. The, those were just some things that, like I said, it's, that's the way it was at the time. And as a kid, I didn't think that much about it. I was kind of happy to, to get that one week. If we, uh, we, there were some before me that didn't get any. You know, they couldn't go at all. So um, I guess at that point, we were just happy to get what we got. And protected from mm -hmm. that type of ideology. Exactly. Right. You know. Yeah. And he's older than I am, so I don't remember the <laughs> white and the, the, the water fountains. I don't remember that. <laughs> what was the atmosphere at the time for race, for race relations in Newport? Any stories you'd like to relate? Me growing up in uh, Jefferson County, and I grew up in a community where that Everybody was the same. I had, uh, we couldn't go to school together, but we played together. And we would go to each other's house. And, uh, they would come to my house and eat, and I'd go to their house and eat, and we'd play. And then we would spend nights with each other. So, but still I couldn't go to school, and we would wonder why. Why can we not go to school? We do everything else together, you know. So. Why can we not go to uh, school? We were concerned about that. But then our parents tried to keep the real reason away f from us. They didn't really, you know, sit down and explain the things uh, to us. They, d they didn't want us to know the real reason because, uh, uh, particularly my mother, she didn't want 
uh, me to have hatred in my heart for anybody. Mm -hmm. So she she didn't explain that to me. And then when uh, reading books and stuff, books that was written on segregation like Uncle Tom's Cabin, she would not let us read that book mm -hmm. because she was afraid it would put hatred in our hearts. And so she kept it away from us until we were in high school and you know where we could understand. I think we did have some hatred after a period of time. At the beginning, you know, we accepted that. We accepted that. But then there could be some hatred come in. But our parents, as she said, our parents would teach us who, that was just it. But um, it's something, you know, we were called out of our name. We were called mm -hmm. out of our name. And, uh, you know, you just wonder why? Because we did have some white friends. We were just brothers and sisters. We were just relatives. We just stayed at one another's house and everything. But then there were some who could see us and call us out of our name. And I know uh, my mother would say, that's not your name, you know. This is your name. That's not your name. That's just what that person said. So if it wasn't for our parents, and you know, I think lots of times when we think back now, maybe we get anger in us now. When we look back yeah. over those years, when we look back over those years, and I often think too, if I went through what I went through, what our parents went through, mm -hmm. what our parents had to go through. And my children, of course they are grown now, they can't imagine that <laughs> I, had to ride in the back of a bus on the seat. They just said, you had to do that? You know, they think that was like, you know, 200 years ago. <laughs> I said, no, that was during my lifetime too, you know. But we accepted it. I'm sort of thinking on how things have changed. When my relatives from Detroit come, they're able to go and stay in the motels or get a chalet or a cabin someplace. And then I think back, um, for me, actually, I stayed at your house a few summers. Yep, I do remember that. They would split us up, yep. you know. Uh, your aunt, Essie, I mm -hmm. stayed at her house. Yes. I'm a Jean. I must have stayed at at least five different places over the years, yes. multiple times. That's the way it was. But, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't think about it. I was happy because everybody was family. Um, and then it dawned on me, actually, uh, could, had we afforded a motel, we couldn't go anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes. yeah, things have changed a whole bunch. Yes. Yeah, because I, I can uh, recall that um, the people in the community here in, in Cock County, they would have to house clean during the summer prior to the 8th of August because uh, people that came from out of town could not stay in hotels. So everybody farmed everybody out to uh, find a bed or a couch somewhere to stay. It was the norm. Mm -hmm. yes, they, it yeah, was, it was you know, norm. That was, was normal yeah. for us to do that. Well, what about from an economic perspective? What, did, what were some of your experiences in regard to race relations economically? I grew up on the farm. And as uh, most people say, Hard work never helped hurt anybody. So I worked in the fields. And we, we grew those vegetables, we grew those vegetables, and we would give it to people in the neighborhood. Didn't sell anything, you know. They could just come and get it. And this was, and we didn't realize, you know, quote, quote, if we were poor, because everybody was like that. So there was really no wealthy person there that had everything and then some that didn't. We all was in that same a category there, helping one another, helping neighbors, black and white in the community where I grew up. And, and you I got to um, realize that when people came to home for the Tennessee picnic, where did all that food come from? Mm -hmm. So it had to be people with gardens. They had to grow mm -hmm. uh, um, gardens to mm -hmm. feed because they would prepare foods in big steel tubs. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how much food that they would prepare prepare for the Tennessee picnic. And donate it. Yeah, donate. no, yes. Did you know then the reason that August 8th and the Tennessee picnic was important to the community? In my case, no. I did not know that until I was an adult. It wasn't, if it was talked about, I certainly didn't key in um, 
that uh, on that uh, aspect of it. Well, I always thought that it actually had something to do with the Emancipation of Proclamation, but originally it was called the Tennessee Picnic, and it was like for everybody to come back home and enjoy themselves at the picnic and everything, but everybody said it would be around the 8th of August, but later on we found out that the 8th of August was during the time that they said that freedom for the slaves uh, happened in Tennessee. Now, the we know the Emancipation of Proclamation happened in January, it was signed in January, but we were told that later on it came down to the various and different states in different months. So for the month of Tennessee, uh, it was like around the 8th of August, but still it was uh, in combination or in conjunction with the Tennessee picnic where everybody came back home and everybody just celebrated we think that the Tennessee picnic start, started in 1947, and that, from what I've read, the, the, the way that the name came about was that the first year they had it here in Cock County, the second year they went to Detroit, and his father, Ralph Rice, uh, lived there, and he would go out to one of the local parks, and he erected a sign that said, Tennessee picnic. <laughs> And that's how the name stuck. Yeah. So why is it important that we continue to remember the 8th of August and the Tennessee picnic? And what would be your takeaway for the next generation? It's something that it's, it's incumbent upon us to teach them uh, about our struggles and, and, and the things that we, and the obstacles that we had to overcome to be where we are today and then for them to be where they are today. So I think it's very important that we teach our young people these things so that they can understand just where we all came from and why they are where they are today. It's mm -hmm. uh, very important for us to keep it going because of our children and our grandchildren. It needs to keep going. They need to know their heritage. They need to know some of the things or the things that our forefathers went through to get to where we are now and why we are where we are now. And the things, the opportunities that we have now didn't come easy. That somebody went before us and paved the way for us and for them. And they, we are standing on somebody's shoulders and they are standing on our shoulders. I'd say nothing is a given meaning nobody gives anything to you. You have to earn it. You have to earn it. You need to know your history. A good example, I think, would be the Voting Rights Act. Um, it's not guaranteed. It has to be renewed every 25 years, you know. Uh, and if you don't know, then it can disappear, you know. Mm -hmm. Just like Freedom for Blacks, we've got a different kind of president today that's mm -hmm. reconstructing history or trying to mm -hmm. and you, you never really know what's going to happen unless you have some type of education and knowledge about what's what's do you mm -hmm. your history your emancipation you know your voting all of those things are, are kind of important and as a retired teacher the kids aren't very interested. Some kids aren't mm -hmm. very interested That's true. in many things at all. Mm -hmm. That's true. Fun, video games, mm -hmm. wasting time. Mm -hmm. And I tend to think if we have some kind of catastrophe, most of our kids, we talked about gardens. How many kids don't know how to make a garden? <laughs> You'd be surprised. I mean, they don't know how to cut up a chicken either. <laughs> cut up a chicken? Probably cook. Uh, I think that um, as a people, we don't document our history. And this opportunity today that PBS has um, um, afforded us is, is a great and wonderful thing. We need to pass on our heritage to our young and um, I think that the Tennessee Picnic helps to make that focus on um, family heritage and um, your ancestors and, and keeps it alive and keeps it moving. Bring generations together, 
one more time mm -hmm. and talk about where we come from and particularly this Tennessee picnic and how to keep it moving. And the bad and the good. Good and the know. bad. Yeah. It has expanded to some degree from what it used to be when it was mostly you go, go to the park when they had the picnic and you had a dance and things, but now there are so many other things involved with it that it's really hard to pin it down and say it's this one thing. But it, for me, it's just a community celebration. And one thing that uh, the, the, the merchants in our community, they know, they look for um, the Tennessee picnic because uh, they know that, that their, their business, they will increase uh, their sales and their businesses and the hotels now, now that we can stay in hotels. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the businesses in Cock County well, they do ask and they say, is this the year for the Tennessee picnic? Mm -hmm. Because now we go every other year, so. Yeah. And it's, uh, even the Chamber of Commerce is actively involved with Tennessee picnic also these days. So at that, that was the last question. I appreciate your, the opportunity for everyone to participate and hope that you had uh, a memorable time doing so.